Stick around, folks, because we're playing all night. answer all your questions and obviously some will not be able to answer yet so have patience with us on that um, again I really appreciate y'all being here I'm gonna turn this over to Shannon to uh, get us started thank you principal Thomas well good evening everyone my name is Shannon Bingham I am a school planning and school administration contractor I work all over the western US um, I've worked in Alaska since about 1990, um, and I've worked intensively for various districts for the past 13 years. Um, I know this is a troubling topic for us to address this evening. We have about a 20-minute presentation designed um, uh, to help you understand some of the rationale behind why, what, why we're proposing what we're proposing to do. Um, you may not agree with our logic. It's definitely not perfect. Um, so we're here to listen, understand, um, and gain your perspective on what we're proposing to do. Um, next to me are four administrators from the district that will hopefully be able to answer some of the questions that you have. Uh, we do not take this lightly. This is the work we've all based our careers on, so a lot of the proposals that we have brought forward are things that we are unaccustomed to doing um, as educators, so some of this is difficult for us as well. So um, keep that in mind as you um, uh, chat with us about some of your perspectives. I'll talk a little bit about who's here. Um, Eric Visti on my left is our Senior Director for Elementary Education. Uh, we also have Tar Tarlisha Wayne, who is our Senior Director 
for special education. Uh, we have Rob Holland, our chief of operations, and we have Jim Anderson, who is our chief of financial operations. So hopefully, given the complexity of what we're about to show you, um, we have the right group of people here to answer some of your questions. Um, we are trying to broadcast this as fully as possible. So I've been told to stand right here, which is not my style. So usually I walk around a lot and try to listen intently. But the idea is that I will make a 20 minute presentation. I can move between this spot and that spot. And then everyone at the table has to stand up to be seen on the webcams. So we're trying for folks that were unable to get here because of the snow or personal schedules or meals or whatever, to be able to broadcast this as fully as possible so that as many people as possible can benefit from the information and become part of the conversation. So that's why we're structured the way that we are. Um, as far as what we intend to do this evening, I will show you about a 20 minute presentation that will give you a perspective on what's happening in the Western US and in Alaska with school budgets and how school districts are responding to financial issues and what's kind of happening. Um, Anchorage is definitely not alone in what we are proposing here. So we hope that you will understand that um, this is a bigger situation than just us here in, in this school district. Um, after I make that presentation, we will have a um, question and answer session. I think we will have enough time to address everyone's question. There is a sign-up sheet out in the hallway. We are trying to limit everyone to three minutes, and um, MJ will ring a bell when you have about 30 seconds left, so try to listen for that. I may not hear it because I'm a little deaf, so um, I can hear that actually. So that's, that's the idea that we have, is that we would conduct the evening in that fashion. If after my 20 minute presentation, we're still leaving the sign up sheet out, out in the hall open, if you would like to speak, run out and put your name on the list and then they're going to hand that to me and I'm going to call everyone in the order that they signed up. So with that, I'll go ahead and launch into the presentation and introduce uh, Jim Anderson to put a financial front end on what I'm about to say. Good evening, I'm Jim Anderson. I've been with uh, ASD now a little over seven years and I've been the Chief Financial Officer for a little bit over six years. Um, on the next slide, you'll see a chart that I made a year ago um, that has changed only slightly, um, or, or you won't, but potentially you will see a chart. And what this chart describes, um, there it is. Um, what this chart describes is it shows in fiscal year 17, um, all funding for education in the state of Alaska starts with the base student allocation. And that's an amount of money per student. And then it goes through a formula from then on. And that's what kicks off the level of state funding and of course, naturally, the level of local funding. I, I will start by saying that Anchorage has always, always, always provided 100% of local funding and is one of very few boroughs and cities in the state that has continued to prioritize education. So as I talk through this, um, I understand that, that um, this city, all of us taxpayers, I live right down the road from here, um, have always funded education, but I do want to describe because on social media and AM talk radio
talk about real briefly. And we also merged more programs and reduced more staff. When we got to fiscal year 20, um, that was the one year where inflation in Alaska actually did drop. And with the use of state one-time money and a large amount of fund balance, um, that was the first year that we didn't have to do large reductions. But then you can see COVID kicked off. In fiscal year 21, we lost 4,500 students um, during the pandemic at the very beginning of it. And at the same time, we did receive a little bit of COVID money from the federal government, and we used a large amount of fund balance, um, but we had a significant gap. Um, for the last two years, we've had a large amount of federal relief dollars that really hid this gap that started in July 1st, 2017, at the beginning of school year 17-18. The gap has always been there, and from a money guy perspective, I've seen this coming for years. Um, and, and I go to Juno a lot. I, I, have, I have briefed this chart in um, all the major committees in both the House and Senate last spring. Um, and, and I've been very open about how this fiscal cliff was coming. And without a base student allocation adjustment to inflation-proof education funding, that we would run out of the bulk of our federal money at the end of this school year, and we would have a large gap. So last year after, <clears throat> and, and it sounds like I'm slamming people in Juno. I'm not. They had some really tough decisions to make, and they had to make some priorities. But, but it was very clear um, what Anchorage was facing, I think, to everyone I talked to and every committee I talked to. Um, so at the end of last year, they did approve a very small BSA increase of $30 that didn't kick in this year, but it kicks in next year. So that represents a 0.5% increase in funding over seven years. In seven years, we're still planning next year's budget as if it was August of 2016. Because even if it sounds like we got $30 more, the spending power between August of 2016 and now is $80 million difference, even if we had the same amount of money. We have significantly less money to operate the district than we did six years ago. And, and I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that because I love talk show or talk radio. I listen to it every morning, but it doesn't mean they're right. They're not lying because they really believe what they're saying. But, but they are wrong when they say that it isn't, it isn't a revenue problem, it's a spending problem. We have the same revenue when we start this budget for next year almost um, as if it was seven years ago with, with a little bit of federal money left over. And, and that's where we stand. And so we, we have made a lot of reductions in the last nine school board meetings straight um, every two weeks. I started in July and we have been raising to the school board every horrible possible option to get to a balanced budget, which by state statute, we must do. And by city charter, we must pass our budget in February, which generally is three to four months before we find out if the state is gonna give us one-time funding. So that's the position we're in, that's the timeline. We laid out Ignite, Immersion, Sports, um, a, a lot of programs that are, that are truly important to everybody from the staff down to the student who wakes up in the morning and is excited to go to school because that really is his or her favorite part of the day. And the reason that we started early laying out those things that were emotional is that I knew this year was going to be bad last May when the BSA wasn't increased. And I knew that we were going to talk about school closures. I knew that we were going to talk about sports. And, and we weren't talking about it because we want to talk about it. Honestly, nobody would bring this up for fun. Um, we wanted to talk about it because we couldn't surprise the public in February with a budget that had significant changes in the way ASD operates, and that's why we threw those out early. It was not to panic people. Um, and when we talked school closures, that's why I needed to get school closures out as early as possible, because we need input from the community. We need input from the staff. These are recommendations at this point, and there will be changes from our recommendations in the next six weeks to the school board. But what is true, regardless of what's posted 
in any Facebook post anywhere is that we are starting to build next year's budget at less money when you count inflation than what we had to build the, the budget on August 12th, 2016, on the first day of school that year. And that's, that's why we're here tonight. Um, it's not lost on me that, that this is personal. Um, we don't sit in a room and talk about a program as if it's really just $2 billion. We know it's $2 billion that supports 1,800 kids in the IGNITE program, or $2 million that supports 1,800 kids in the IGNITE program, or sixth grade band and orchestra, and all of these, we get it, we get it. Your feelings, your, your anger, your frustration, they're real and, and we acknowledge that. And, and I wanted to uh, make sure you understand that, that we don't take this lightly, but the state statute says I gotta find $68 million with the school board between now and 20 December to build the budget for next year. And um, at that, I will hand off to Mr. Bingham. Thank you, Jim. trying to figure out the uh, next button. Did I turn it off? There I am. So a lot of districts around, around the West are in the same circumstances that we are. Post-COVID, the COVID money has been um, expended, and a lot of states that were um, dealing with all sorts of funding issues have suddenly reached a budgetary cliff for public schools. So all around the West, a lot of districts that have struggled with school efficiency as uh, family sizes have declined, birth rates have gone down, and we have fewer children in school in the aggregate, have started looking at doing a variety of things. Uh, one is cutting programs. The next one is um, becoming more efficient to the extent that they can by creating bigger schools. Well, that results in consolidating some smaller schools, combining small schools into combinations, and in some cases, pulling the sixth grade up into middle schools if they're currently running as seven, eight. That increases the sizes of those faculties and those student bodies by about 50%. In the modern world of childhood and, and families, we have a lot of specialists that are available to assist children with their learning needs. So in every building, about 35% of the educators in a building are not a general ed teacher, meaning they're not a third grade classroom teacher, they're not a fifth grade classroom teacher. They provide a special service. When our schools are bigger, we're more able to get a full set of those folks into every building. When we are small, we have what are called circuit riders. So a speech therapist or a special education teacher who addresses a certain learning disability may circulate between three or four buildings in order to provide that service. So that's less than optimal. In some cases, art, music, and PE are also partial services in this age when we don't fund the public education fully. So a lot of districts have looked at this whole idea of school consolidation as a mechanism to try to become more efficient, get more children into a building, and have a full set of professionals in every building to serve the needs of every child. Now, everyone may not agree with that strategy, but most of the districts that have looked at an efficiency plan have tried to develop three rounds or three section schools, meaning um, three third grades, three fourth grades, three fifth grades. And the six consolidations that we are sharing with you tonight actually create eight three-section schools for the district. So we were looking at small buildings, basically. So you may say, well, why Birchwood? We're ex an exemplary program. Um, but we're basically looking at smaller size enrollment centers where on this side of the Parks Highway, we have a limited number of people, we have a limited number of children, and this is probably going to be a small program and a small building for a long time. So we're trying to look for places where we can get 
400 kids into a building because we can do a better job. And what we're finding is that we're currently spread so thin from a maintenance standpoint and from a staffing standpoint that if we can get into these larger operations, we feel we can be more effective. And we've looked at our class sizes and found that our bigger buildings are not larger classes. They're the same or they're smaller because we can balance out a lot of the volatility that comes from a small group of kids who may have 45 kids in second grade, 30 kids in third grade, 39 kids in fourth grade. A lot of that kind of evens out and we can have more evenly sized sections <coughs> per grade level. So on this slide, you're seeing this concept explained as level of service. We have 18 schools that are running at less than 65% efficiency according to the Alaska uh, deed office. So what we're trying to do is look at probably the 12 smallest schools in the district and a couple of other schools where we have supplemented neighborhood enrollment by busing a neighborhood in and see if there's a way to combine those facilities into an adjacent facility try to do no harm to children as far as the classroom experience, what they experience when they're in the room with their teacher, and continue to operate as an institution within the financial constraints that we have to work with. So that's been the process behind our identifying the six schools that I'll share with you in just a moment. Around the West, everybody lost about 3% of their enrollment as a result of the pandemic. Some of my districts lost 9%. Um, some of them lost 5%. The majority of them did not get the enrollment back. So a lot of families tried remote learning and decided that was a good fit for their child, and so they stuck with it. So in a lot of cases, we had kind of a a one-time market adjustment in how families uh, use education services and that did not um, correct or change back now that things have gone somewhat back to normal. So everyone is kind of in this situation. Um, and I'm not advancing here. I must not be pushing the right button. I've turned it off once before. There we go. So you can see we've lost about 5,000 children in the last six years. That's a lot of kids um, across the board. Not all of those are elementary school children, but for the most part, we were running pretty inefficiently five years ago, which was the last time I had a significant involvement with the Anchorage School District. And when I came back, I was kind of dismayed to see that we had gone down even further. And given a lot of the property that the Anchorage Housing Authority was putting online that I was, a hope, I was hoping would appeal to families and that uh, this community would grow, uh, economic circumstances, jobs, the pandemic, a variety of things have resulted in us having significantly fewer kids here than we had five years ago. So that puts us in a situation where we're trying to do the same thing with 54 elementary schools that we were doing before, but we have 5,000 fewer children and we have the funding that came along with those 5,000 children is gone now. We have the residual funding and as Jim has mentioned, we don't have an inflation increment along with that to address the fact of how costs have escalated to do virtually everything in American life over the last 36 months. So that's the circumstance that we're in. We're not alone. Um, and um, level of service is something that we're really thinking about. We're looking at every child inside of the classroom. And what do those children experience the 90% of their day when they're in the classroom versus what's the overall school experience like? So what we're talking about here with closures is the overall school experience, and that's pretty hard to take for buildings that have been the centers of these communities for decades.
But what we're trying to do as the folks that are responsible for what children walk out of, what they walk out with when they receive our services, we're trying to focus on that. How do we make sure that that classroom experience, the number of children that child may be in the room with, the quality of the instructor, the level of service that that child has from other professionals in the building, how do we preserve that? And we have put forth the idea that we think efficiency and trying to have larger schools and larger faculties and serve larger groups of kids would be the better way to do that. And we've identified these six schools that are smaller programs, predominantly using that rationale. In small schools, you see some of the professionals on the top of this slide and over on the TV monitors here, you can see occupational therapists, vision therapists, special education teachers, instructional coaches, psychologists, um, a variety of people that serve the needs of elementary children. We pick up more of that whenever schools are larger because we can fund more of those professionals to be in a building for a longer part of the day or more days during the week. At the secondary level, in some of our seven, eight middle schools where we're small, we're suffering from course offerings just because we don't have enough children in the room, I mean, in the building rather, to offer advanced courses that we would like to offer. The master schedules get a little bit weak when we fall below about 500 middle schools in the building, and a lot of districts have identified bring the sixth grade up into the middle school as a way to address um, that issue and we get more people into the building, more faculty, more professionals to address the same kind of challenges that elementary school children have. On this graphic you can see our enrollment situation. So if you look at that total with preschool you can see then in the 23-24 school year, also known as FY24, we had 42,805 students. And um, uh, that's what we're forecasting for next year. And by 2027, we will be down another 5,000. We're gonna lose about 2.1% per year. So this is our forecast. So all the pain and suffering that we've incurred during the last five years that Jim has lived through financially, we're gonna have another five years of that. So these first six schools that we are talking about, we, there may be a second group as we try to become more efficient and there are several legs of the stool. There's programs that we think we can offer by an alternative mechanism that could be cut there is the school consolidations where we create fewer operating budgets and try to operate more efficiently by putting more children in fewer buildings. The last leg of that stool is class size. And when we start cutting PPR and we start going from 25 children in a kindergarten to 28 or 29 in buildings that were probably designed to hold 23 or 24 in the room, um, that's the hard step that we want to take dead last because of the impact on individual children in those individual classrooms for that last resort of budget cutting. So that's the reason that we're talking about school consolidation and closing schools is that we're looking at that classroom unit, we're trying to make that class size reduction, the last thing that we do. And we think that becoming a district with fewer larger schools would help us deliver a similar level of service and preserve those class sizes right until the end. Um, this next slide, there we go, shows the birth rate. You can see that we have 750 babies born every year than we did five years ago. So basically what's coming at us for the next five years is built in. We just don't have the babies to have the kindergartners that we need five years from now. 
So that's the reason why we're looking at what's called a, 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 a systemic budgetary situation or a structural budgetary situation, rather, where we know we ha are going to have fewer children to serve because of the birth, what's happening with the birth rate. These are moms that reside in the Anchorage municipality. So on this slide, you can see what's called grade distribution. And we're comparing 2017 to 2022. And you can see that five years ago, we had about 500, three to 500 more children in every grade. So what has happened is these smaller grades have survived into our system. And this is the reason why this is headed for middle school. And some of the problems that we have at middle school with course offerings and the number of children that are in some of our smaller buildings are going to exacerbate because the grades that are coming in are going to be smaller. So as we look at trying to do the same thing, offer the same level of service that we have always offered, we know that we are going to be in different circumstances during the next five years. So here's the set. I'm going to read off my page and talk through these briefly. So we're proposing six closures. Abbott Loop, which is currently at about 65%. Uh, we are proposing to move the children who are north of 88th Avenue to Kassoon and the children that are south of 88th Avenue to Trailside. So we're cutting that student body in half in order to create two three-round schools, which we will successfully do if the community decides to follow through with that consolidation. Um, we are considering Birchwood ABC, which is at 51% of its capacity now. And we would relocate the gen ed kids to Homestead and the special education self-contained students in this building we're currently evaluating everybody's IEP, looking at what professionals are elsewhere in the Eagle River area, and figuring out the best placement. Ms. Wayne is working very hard with her staff to figure out how that might all um, transpire, and she'll be able to answer detailed questions once we get into the Q&A. Um, the repurposing of this building, it is proposed that we um, that Eagle Academy would take this building. And we're just trying to be transparent with everybody. We wanted to come out here to these meetings and say, if we're going to vacate these buildings, they're not going to be boarded up. We have uh, charters that are part of our public school family that are in other space that could benefit from being in a building like this. The cost to us is nominal. And so we are proposing to responsibly use what we own. And um, so we're just being as transparent with you as possible that that would be what would be offered. If you look at the rationale column in this table, you're going to see what every alternative use for all of our buildings are based on our current conversations. Now, I know there are three board members in the audience that um, are going to be responsible for making this decision. So all of this is up to them at the end of the day. But our initial observation of what might work, given where people are located, what some of those needs are, how um, students and families might move around, where people would land, uh, that's what is being proposed. At Clatt Elementary, we are proposing to take the students that are immediately around Clatt, which is about 115 students, and put those students in Ocean View. And we would take the students who are in the Diamond Estates uh, Mobile Home Park and assign those students to Campbell STEM. Both of those schools would become three round schools, three section schools, as a result of that change Homestead would also become a three-round school as a result of what we're proposing with Birchwood ABC. At Nunaka Valley, we would move the students east of Boniface 
to Chester Valley, and we would move the students west of Boniface to Russian Jack, and repurpose Nunaka Valley as a pre-K academy. So there are already a lot of pre-kindergarten kids at Nunaka Valley, and it would become almost exclusively a pre-kindergarten academy. Yeah. So I'm going to speed up through the rest of this and just kind of wrap up. Um, Northwood, we are proposing relocating the majority of those students to Lake Hood Elementary School. Northwood would also be repurposed as a pre-K academy. And then Wonder Park, we are going to divide between Willowa and Ptarmigan. And both Willowa and Ptarmigan would become three round schools. And Wonder Park would be repurposed for ANCCS and STREAM. So that's the proposal for this evening. Um, again, a lot of really difficult information there. Um, we are here to listen. Um, I would like to invite everyone who feels they have a perspective that would be of value to us to please come forward and speak. Um, the microphone is right here. Mr. Thim is going to run the timer. And I have my list of folks. I'm going to tell you how many people I have. Pardon? Oh, OK. I'm being told I can move around a little bit. Um, so I've got about 20 people. So at three minutes apiece, I think that's about an hour. So I think we have managed our time pretty well. Um, I don't think we have a big catastrophe, but please respect others that want to speak. So with that, I'm going to mention the restrooms are just out the door to the right. Um, there are laptops set up for the survey out there in the hall. The um, QR code for the survey is posted where you can scan that with your smartphone and take the online survey, which is going to be a major decision support item for the Board of Education. So please take the survey, whether you do it with your smartphone or you do it on one of the Chromebooks outside in the hallway. So with that, I'm going to call our first speaker, who is Joseph Smiley. Uh, everybody hear me all right? Excellent. So I had a two-part question. Um, the first being wasn't discussed as heavily this time, but obviously the student outcomes are important to ASD and especially parents. And here we have that ABC program. And if we have overlapping schools at a low capacity, was consideration giving to bringing, say, the homestead students to Birchwood and implementing that into the ABC program, which has proven track records that compared to the rest of ASD has performed pretty well. If so, what was the outcome of that consideration? Because it seems like that would be more likely to succeed rather than send that program to another school and hope that it's implemented in the same way it was here. The other bit that I wanted to ask about is that a lot is effort by the leadership here has been shown to us that we've got a population decline over time and we also have decreasing state funding both of which has put us in this large budget shortfall um, but Mr. Anderson spoke to this a little bit as far as expenditures but I haven't seen a graphic that showed ASD's expenditures relative to the inflation relative to the flat state funding yet. So if one of the long-term fixes for Anchorage School District and the budget shortfall is inflation-proof spending, I would like to see how we have taken steps before this to try and reduce that spending. And it was, like I said, spoken to by Mr. Anderson, but I didn't really catch an order of magnitude of those reductions in cost because inflation is going to continue to go up as our expenditures. If our population is going down, then 
wouldn't an inflation-proof spending or an increase in spending at all be a bit like giving a drunk a drink? Thank you. Sure. Well, Joseph, I'll try to address your first question. Um, the buildings between um, Homestead and Birchwood are more or less in equivalent condition. There's more development potential on the east side of the parks in the Eagle River area as far as future growth. And I think there are more children in that building right now. So part of the thought there was that bigger is, is the guiding factor. So this was the smaller school. So as far as bringing that constituency here, um, we didn't consider that. But obviously, it's a what's good for the goose is good for the gander situation when you look at that. But basically, there's a numbers difference there where there's more development potential on the east side of the parks than there is in this neighborhood. And that was the reason why this school was designated to go easterly. And then I'll defer to Jim to answer the second part of your question. And to tag on to Shannon's, we talked quite a bit about Birchwood's ABC program and keeping it intact. I, I don't know how many in here in the room remember the, well, everyone, if you were here, remembers the earthquake. But shortly after that, we moved Eagle River Elementary to Birchwood, which was an ABC program. And we were able to operate that school within a school quite well. Um, there was some initial um, well, not just hesitancy, it was probably stronger than that, but it ended up working really well. We have multiple schools within a school throughout the district, um, but it ended up being the, the smaller school with um, the least um, long-term potential, um, and, and that's really why it was chosen. But we value the ABC program, you value the ABC program, and we had no intention of it going away um, I can put some charts up that show all the different cuts. We'll put it on our webpage that we've done over the years. Um, but when you say reduce spending, as everything costs more, the fact that you're reducing doesn't mean that you're still going to be less than the price of paper in 2016. Paper costs 40% more than it did in 2016. So even if we reduce paper, the price is still higher. So it would be incredibly difficult to take every commodity within the district um, to, to include salaries, right? I mean, we started the year, if you look at the end of September, um, we started the school year with 12 cafeterias with no people working in them um, and 40, 40 student nutrition personnel short. We had seven nurse vacancies, 40 teacher vacancies, um, 20 plus um, special ed teacher vacancies, and why do we have all these vacancies to include school bus drivers? Because we kept trying to keep salaries as low as we could possibly do, and we saw what happened this year. So when people say, how much more can you cut? I think we saw the outcome of how low we could keep salaries. And the reality is seven school nurses, 12 cafeterias, and 12,000 kids weren't moved to school on the first week of school because we have kept costs as low as we possibly could. And when bus drivers were getting paid $7 more an hour outside of the school district, it, it finally bit us. And, and so it, it's difficult to show all the costs and reductions we've done and, and compare it to a 2016 dollar. But I, I'll see if there's any possible way to visually show that. But it's, it's it would be difficult. So Joseph, if you'd like to come up afterwards, we could try to answer a couple more details. And we'd be glad to follow up with anybody that has a super detailed question. Just give us your contact information and we'll do a little bit of research and call you back with answers. I'd like to call Terry Gallant next, please. Terry, oh, there she is. Hey, my name is Terry Gallant. I've worked for the district for 17 years in the life skills program. So I've been in several schools. <sighs> Sorry, this is emotional for me. Birchwood has been the best place for the kids that I work with because of the ACP, A, sorry, ABC philosophy. The kids at this school will beg their teachers to assist our children in APE, 
at recess, you'll see them going and talking to the kids. They know which ones need assistance getting up the stairs on the playground. They know which ones, if they see them running down the hall, to run down the hall and be their buddy and bring them back. I worked at one of the schools that I hear we may be going to with the life skills program, and it did not work. The students at that school don't have the life skills that our general ed kids get here. They learn, sorry, I've got, I've got facts here, but they learn about everything to do with life. They learn manners. They learn to be courteous. They learn to be helpful. And not all schools do that. That's an ABC philosophy. If you take our kids out of, sorry, the life skills kids, out of the ABC program, what are they gonna get? And why are the life skills program, are we going to Homestead? Because we were told we're going to Fire Lake. And you don't have us listed up there to go to Fire Lake. So, I don't know, I mean, I have numbers and I have, I just, I just think that our kids need the ABC philosophy, whether it be in this building or it be somewhere else. Um, we need more gen ed kids to be with our kids. If we do go to Fire Lake, there are nine special classrooms. You have your SLCs, you have your life skills, you have your Buddy Bear preschools, and there'll be 11 gen ed classes. There'll be almost as many SPED classes as there are general ed. Who are they gonna look up to? Who's gonna be there to help them? Who's gonna be their role model? Thank you for your comment. Um, we are, um, we have not decided where um, the two life skill, the life skill program is going to go. If you could email me your information um, and the information that you shared, We'll take that into consideration while we're doing all of our um, other research. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. We'll if take Martin Hansen next. If I can add on to her question, um, just a short answer. We knew that when we brought it up, the principals had just found out a few hours prior that we still had a lot of details to work out as a staff, as school leadership, um, and bringing in all the teachers. What we didn't want to do, though, again, was wait until December when we will have a lot of this worked out and then surprise the community. So we know that we don't have all the answers now. We'll continue working this through November, through December, through January um, with a focus on your, on your kids. So Martin Hansen, and let's have Mitchell Cullum come up in the wings and uh, speak after Martin. Uh, okay, um, am I uh, working the mic properly? Thank yes, you. Sir. Okay, uh, my name is Martin Hansen. Um, I guess I could say I care about kids and education. I retired, and now I find that I spend three days a week as a kindergarten teacher's aide at Willowa School, and I love it. Um, in the winter, I teach six and eight, six, seven-year-olds how to cross-country ski. I have a real short question or message. Um, ASD is not considered all of the ways they could save money. Uh, at present, they're pushing ahead pretty vigorously to rebuild Inlet View School, the school I live next door to and that I love, at a cost of about $37 million plus additional costs. Um, the, the numbers are a little fuzzy, but it looks like it could save 10 to $15 million by doing a rebuild. That has not been considered, and the reason I say it hasn't been considered is because in September, ASD went to the Anchorage Urban Design Commission to seek approval for the most expensive option and received it. They have not backed off on this. As they've been working on it for two years and they've not been interested in saving any money. So my question then is, why has not this been put also into the options? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Hansen, for the question. First of all, just very briefly, let's talk about the difference between capital money, which is borrowed from the taxpayers, and operating funds. We cannot commingle the two. Capital money is borrowed from the taxpayers as a bond. We cannot use any of that money by statute to pay operating expenses. So the, the two, unfortunately, or fortunately, they just don't overlap. So any money we would save or spend on Inlet View has nothing to do at all with the budget. The administration has no plans, per se, to build Inlet View. 
the plan is to put it on a 2024 bond where it currently sits on our CIP that was approved by the board. The CIP is the six-year capital improvement plan. And there it lives as a placeholder for a 2024 bond where it will be put to the voters to decide whether the school should be built. Thank you. Um, Mitchell Collum followed by Robin Gable. Yeah, I'd like to speak to what he just said. It, I, I'm here to talk about some of the same issues that Martin Hansen just spoke to. Uh, my name is Mitchell Cullum. I also live next to Inlet View Elementary, and I'm the father of a, a future student. And I also attended ASD when I was a child, grew up in Anchorage. Um, so just to speak on the, the ASD capital, uh, proposed capital uh, money that is looking to be spent. On the 5th of December, uh, there's, a, there's an amendment to a memorandum that is, has been scheduled to be voted on uh, at the board meeting uh, coming up here about a month or so out. And they, it is proposed to utilize the remaining $37 million of the state bond debt reimbursement to use that to fund Inlet View's project. And so that is not coming from approval of the voters. I just want to emphasize that. That is coming from the approval of the school board. And you actually went to the voters here back in April and asked for money for this project, and it was rejected. So I just wanted to touch on that before I get to my, my points here. Uh, we have heard ASD say that closing this school and five others will save 500 to 600,000 per year per school. These proposed closures are happening at the same time ASD board members will be voting next month to allocate 37 million for a new replacement school for Inlet View Elementary in a wealthy, politically connected downtown neighborhood in Anchorage. If ASD adopted a remodel for Inlet View Elementary instead of a new construction replacement, it would free up 10 to 15 million in currently unallocated state funds that could be used to keep this school open. Keep open the popular language immersion programs, music programs, and after school sports programs. It is inappropriate for ASD administration to pursue and for bond board members to approve 37 million in state bond debt funds for Inlet View Elementary replacement as opposed to a less expensive remodel given the current budget issues. ASD is in a tough spot budget wise. There is no denying that. I understand and recognize this, but ASD <clears throat> needs to prioritize needs versus wants just like you or I would do with our own personal budgets. If your car dies when you are in a tough spot budget-wise, you don't go buy a new car. You go used car shopping. Please contact Anchorage School Board members and ask them to fund Inlet View Remodel instead of a new construction replacement. And feel free to remind them that the Anchorage voters rejected their request for a new construction Inlet View Elementary replacement back in April. ASD has considered adopting a remodel instead of a, or ha, sorry, this is a question here for you. Has ASD considered adopting a remodel instead of a new construction replacement for Inlet View to free up 10 to $15 million? Um, so I'm gonna kind of wrap this up. Mitchell, I'm gonna ask for a three yeah, word answer. I got, I got this one. Um, so one, the board hasn't decided yet what they're gonna do with the 37 million um, but I do want to know, all, most of tonight's comments focused on Birchwood families and staff, and we, we will answer this, but, but I don't want to spend the next 10 minutes talking about Inlet View because the I, board I'm, I'm hasn't made a decision yet. Available funding for um, the budget. Roger. It could be used to keep open your proposal. I can tell you about, closures. so when we estimated how much it would cost if you closed an elementary school, at the time we didn't have a repurposed plan. We, and we didn't know exactly where the kids were gonna go, so we assumed worst case, four bus routes per school to move the kids to some other school yet to be determined. We hadn't done a transportation analysis because we didn't know where the kids were going. Each bus route's about 125 to 130,000 each. So closing six schools times four bus routes each would have been 24 new buses at 100,000 apiece, uh, 100,000 plus. As it turns out, as we just finished transportation analysis this week, we're only gonna to need to add three or four total buses. So the actual cost savings will be much, much more 
than half a million dollars per school. Because that's what I've heard repeated several times in, the work, in your work sessions. It's been five to 600,000 per school. Again, we tried to put information out as early as possible, knowing there were a lot of things we didn't know. We didn't know where the kids were gonna go. We didn't know how many buses we needed. And it's just in the past 48 hours that we were able to complete the transportation analysis. So the facts will continue to change and it's not because we lied at the beginning, it's that we have more information now than we had two days ago. So and you will see those in future board meetings that numbers will continue to change as we're able to refine what those numbers are. And Mitchell, maybe you and Jim can chat after the meeting okay. about. Well, I was just curious if maybe you guys could speak to whether or not you're pursuing possibly freeing up that 10 to $15 million. Um, I could take the question sitting down and answer it. Jim's the guy that would answer that question, but we'll try to address it after the, after the meeting. I'd like to call Robin Gable, followed by Elizabeth Silvernail. Good evening. Uh, my name's Robin Gable, and I have a kindergartner here at Birchwood, um, so I'm pretty new to this. Um, I will say I have a few comments and then a, a couple questions. Um, first of all, I was really hesitant to even send my kid to ASD, um, but Birchwood stood out like a unicorn as far as curriculum is concerned and character and values that are reinforced. And so it was the only reason I felt comfortable even sending my kid to this district. So I just wanted to point out that the culture and value of character that Ms. Gallant pointed out I think is really important for, um, to be recognized in this school. And I think a lot of parents probably echo my feelings there. I, um, I kind of doubt there's another example in the ASD of character traits like we have here at Birchwood. So my first question is, what happened to the lottery? Um, why is it that Birchwood couldn't open up to a lottery? I know they were on one at one point and were at full capacity. Why could we not have a lottery? Because I have a feeling that parents nearby would want these outcomes for their children. The, ch the outcomes here are excellent. And um, I think enrollment would be full with a waiting list because of the proven outcomes of this program. Um, I'd also like to see where there's administrative cuts. I haven't really seen how anything administratively is coming out in order to balance the budget issue. Um, and I'd also like to know if you can assure us as parents that our children are going to have the exemplary outcomes we have here at Homestead. And by that I mean socially and academically, because that is why we're here. Um, and I think that you might find a lot of parents like me would leave the district if we didn't have this school. So um, I'll wrap it up with that, thank you. So I'm gonna ask Eric to answer your questions one and three, and Jim to quickly comment on question two. Okay. Yeah, hi, um, Eric Visti, uh, Senior Director for Elementary Education. Um, with, with regards to lottery, what we do in the school district is every uh, late winter, we get our demographics and, and projection enrollment, and we get our overall uh, PTR based off of that for allocating all our classrooms to every school in elementary school. Um, from that um, is how the number of classrooms, the number of teachers that each school is allocated. Um, that process and that communication happens usually in January to February. Um, I actually looked at your enrollment and your wait list just the other day. Um, you do have a little bit of an enrollment and wait list. Um, I, would, I would tell you that that wouldn't fill up your school. Um, and we also are talking about conversations with schools that are twice as big as, as, as Birchwood here too. Um, so school size is not necessarily the sole de determination for whether or not the school comes up for the closure of the six schools that we're talking about. May I follow uh, up? Mm -hmm. Do you have any information on the outcomes of bigger schools and bigger classes as, a, as opposed to smaller schools and not necessarily smaller class size, but maybe smaller school populations like ours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I was principal in Girdwood before, which is a pretty similar size school. Um, and we were doing a great job, and I would agree, you know, Birchwood is a unicorn. We've got several unicorn schools in our school district, and as the senior director, I'd, I would, incur, I would um, advocate for all of my schools, frankly. Um, I, at the end of the day, uh, with the six schools, we're in round one of conversations about closures. I don't think in future rounds of school closures, 
it, it, it moves past academic outcomes, and I'm sorry to say that. I'm truly am. That's very disappointing. What about what they would get at Homestead? You could comment on how the program would be reinstituted there. Say that again. Homestead, what will, could she expect at Homestead? Um, what, the, our, what we're recommending is because the ABC program, we do believe and we do um, support the ABC program in that our recommendation is to maintain the ABC program um, through Homestead and moving indefinitely and forward. May, may I just shortly follow up on that? I, I'm just wondering, are you planning to fully implement it for the whole school or are you doing the school within the school model? Um, is it going to be this mm -hmm. program in another building or is it going to be a hybrid? Yeah, so the recommendation is that the Birchwood program would continue um, and would be placed at Homestead Elementary School. So similar to several schools that we have, it would be a dual program school. Um, so you'd have the neighborhood program at Homestead. You'd also have the Birchwood, a the ABC program there at Homestead also. Quick, quick answer to the admin uh, cuts question, please, and then we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Elizabeth Silvernail. So just like with the things that I knew that the community needed to know first, even though we didn't have all the answers and we were still working on it, because I knew those were the most emotional, personal to anybody, I also know that nobody loses sleep on cutting admin, nobody. So I needed to take the time and make sure we went through every directorate, every department. We're going through hundreds of budget lines, looking at very detailed cuts at all levels. We're looking at software programs. How many users? How frequently do those users use it? How much does it cost compared to another one that's cheaper? We're looking at every facet of the administration. And um, we have multiple school board members in the room who um, know that, that we have all along been looking at it. But no one was going to lose sleep or show up at a microphone if I said we're cutting admin. I needed to give you all time to, to know this was coming, potentially, for the board to talk to the community while we're working out the details. And you'll start seeing the administration cuts in December, but, but frankly, other than a few of us, most people won't look at them. Um, but if you look at how, where our money is, if you take out maintenance and all of administration, property insurance, liability insurance, workers' comp, payroll, HR, all of the administrative functions, it's maybe 8% of the total budget. $68 million is 13% of our total budget. We can't get there. And we see that, that uh, I mean, I've been doing these surveys for six years, guaranteed. You, you don't even have to look before you know admin will always be first. Um, and that's why I wanted to do it right and all of us wanted to do it right, because we, this district in, in the past made administration cuts, but they didn't make sure they knew what the impacts of those cuts were, and years later, some systems broke. So this time, we're looking at it from a systems perspective. Just real quickly, and then I'll be finished. Um, thank you for that, and I'll be looking at the administrative cuts when they come out, I appreciate that. Um, I just wonder, you know, like you were commenting on the price of paper. Um, I don't really know how many schools are just pencil and paper, paper like ours is. Um, if, I don't know if other elementary schools use tablets or computers and where those costs might come in, or if, if we'd been given the option to maybe contribute um, some of those costs in order to keep our school. Just an idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is Elizabeth in the room? Hi, my name is Liz Silvernail. Um, I have a student here at Birchwood ABC, and I was also a student here when I was in elementary school. Um, and I'm also the secretary of the Birchwood Advisory Committee. And I more so have comments and things that I would like to bring to your attention, as well as school board members and other community members that are in attendance um, versus questions. Um, so, as you know, and has been a point of discussion, the, a the ABC curriculum is a very important part of our school car culture. Um, and, you know, as a community member and having a student here, I just want it to be known that I'm opposed to the closing of Birchwood ABC School. Um, 
I think that proposing to close down, close down this school because our achievement data for math and reading and behavior is among the highest in the district goes directly against the Anchorage School Board's um, board goals that are listed in the Strategy XXVI publication. And so I just want everybody to take a look at that. And then also, um, I propose that if schools necessarily do have to be combined, that I agree with the other proposition that Homestead possibly be brought over to Birchwood. Um, I am under the impression that the number of students there can be absorbed into our school um, with the amount of space that we have. Um, and one other factor that I think is important to note is that we will lose some of our administrative staff. I understand that some of our teachers will be able to go and implement the ABC program, but one of our hugest advocates for the program is our principal. And um, I'm sure that, you know, the Homestead staff is great too, but we, um, frankly, he's the only person that I trust to advocate for the program. And having it as a school within a school type of a program, I'm concerned that it will lose its integrity. <laughs> And then also just a final thing, um, just to kind of speak on the other things about um, the Inlet View School and things like that. I feel like it's not a good idea to just oppose something without proposing other options and other solutions. So I feel like that is a pertinent part of this conversation. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Elizabeth. Jennifer Ching followed by Heather Calcaterra. Hi, my name's Jennifer Chang. I'm a mom of three. I'm gonna try not to cry. Um, I have a third grader who wants to sell his Pokemon cards to raise money for the school, which just breaks my heart. Birchwood APC has a great curriculum. And my fear is if we move it to a different school, we are gonna lose that. Mr. Thomas meets with the students to do their phonograms, every single one to pass. We have John, our BPO, who meets with the kids every day, says their names, fist bumps, high fives. Uh, sorry, emotional, and just, I am afraid that if we go to Homestead that we'll lose a lot of that. Homestead's not a bad school. I have friends that go there, they love it, but I feel, what we have here is special, and to move it, I'm just afraid that it will fade away and we'll lose that integrity. I know schools are gonna have to close, it's inevitable. We, we see the numbers, it's, it's a hard decision to make and I don't envy the school board or anyone here today having to make those decisions. But it's our school and we're gonna try to keep it open our kids are the future. That's their mo motto is we are the future. <laughs> and we're not giving them a very good future right now. <laughs> One concern or question I had is we had heard Eagle Academy coming here. And I don't know if very many people know, but it was a breakaway of Birchwood ABC. They have our values. So is it being considered to merge those programs? or give the opportunity for Birchwood ABC students to have first pick to stay with a program that's similar to theirs in value and integrity and their values, instead of moving it to a school that I just, I don't see how it's gonna work in Homestead. Like I said, I'm not trying to knock their school, they have a great principal, they have great teachers, but I just, I do worry that that is going to be a difficult transition to keep what we have here so I just want to know if that is an option or if we thought about that to merge it and if it is a possibility to at least give our current students an opportunity to do that first choice or be able to lottery in or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We're not sure the extent to which we can answer that question um, on behalf of of the other school, but um, Eric's gonna just comment briefly on the potential for that, and I'm gonna ask uh, Heather to be in the wings to speak next, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and I'll just say, um, you know, the program that you have is a, I think I, I, I'm a big fan of the ABC, whether I'm standing here in front of you or standing in the crowd with you um, at, at your red, white, and blue ceremony. Um, I think that what your, your question or your ask for, we, we hear that, and that's something that we can bring back in our conversations as we look at what might happen if, if the school ends up being repurposed. So um, I think everyone here hears that, the board members here hear that, the, the administration here hears that, so thank you for sharing that. So Heather, far, followed by Mary Kaposi. Hi, my name is Heather Calcaterra, and I have been a parent at Birchwood for the past 10 years, um, heavily involved in the PTA for the past three. Um, I didn't plan on speaking tonight, but one thing that brought me up here was my pride. My husband and I are proud to be a part of the school community, proud of the structure, proud of the character traits students are expected to portray. Proud of the testing scores, proud we were one of the top schools on behavior, proud of students' academic awards and rewards, and most of all, proud of our amazing, dedicated teachers, staff, and principal. Our program and school proves that when students are pushed to their full potential, success happens, and a reason for every child to feel proud of themselves. We work hard and play hard inside these walls, and it saddens me to think this ABC school will be shut down. It's successful because of the environment we, we maintain. This cannot carry on in a mixed environment to its full potential. I'm concerned that um, moving to Homestead, our program, we're losing a principal that knows the ABC program. Um, our teachers, we go through special training, um, to, to keep up with the programs that we use here at Birchwood. Um, so that is a main concern for me, is having a principal of a school take on, it's, it is a big undertaking. I mean, the school has accomplished a lot, and the students accomplish a lot, and I just would hate to see it go away. I think it's an injustice to families who still believe in the Back to Basics program. I feel like that's being stripped. Um, taking the pride away from the school community is priceless. I'm asking you to reconsider the decision and not take away a very successful program in the district, one that ASD can take pride in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Mary Kaposi, followed by Laura Cox Wilson. Hi, my name is Mary Kaposi. Um, I'm a mother of three. We're a retired military family. Um, my oldest is now a senior in high school at Chugiak. Um, she started kindergarten here. Um, I can't say enough about this school. It's done wonders for my children. And, you know, moving and being military community, you know, switching schools. But we've always come back to Birchwood. It's just, I can't even explain to you like what it's done for my kids. My, my daughter's putting in an application for Air Force Academy. Um, she works with the Partners Club at Chugiak because of the life skills program here. She loves working with those kids. And she learned all of that here. You know, it started with Mr. Godfrey when she was a kindergartner. You know, he came back to Mr. Blake and now Mr. Thomas. And there's something about the school that no matter, you know, even with the change of principals and some change of staff, it's, it's still this core philosophy at the school that I just don't think that my, my kids are gonna get anywhere else. I currently have a second grader. Um, you know, every teacher at Chugiak at Mirror Lake, they know these Birchwood kids. They, they, they say it, they can pick them out of a crowd. They look at adults in the face. They're respectful, courteous, kind. And I just can't say enough about this, this school. I just, I don't know. It's, it's indescribable until you experience it, but there's something special about it. And, you know, my kids, I don't think, could have gone anywhere better than here. So I, I really would wish you would reconsider and um, think about the kids, too, and the program, you know, and how important it is to these children. Um, I liked the suggestion of maybe possibly you know, bringing the academy here and giving Birchwood kids first choice. I think those programs are very similar and it would benefit everyone involved. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Laura Cox Wilson, followed by Karen Walter.
Good evening, my name is Laura Cox Wilson. I have four children in the Anchorage School District. Um, one of which who started an IEP in elementary school. Small school like this, strong community, um, a lot of staff backing behind him. He was able to exit his IEP and enter into a 504 plan and now he's a senior and will be graduating this year. So small schools and small communities like Birchwood ABC have high impacts on not only individuals and students who are in general education, but those who have the special education and the life skills needs as well. Um, my question today is I'm curious if the Anchorage School District has any data or if there's been any research done to support the ideology or the assumptions that consolidating schools increasing class sizes, and rerouting small school communities will in fact have a positive outcome for students, parents, teachers, and this community. Um, I, thank you for your question. I can try to address that. Um, increasing class size, no. Um, that's a loser. So um, very clear research that small class size um, is most profoundly <laughs> beneficial to children in grades PK through two. And then after that, um, the research is weaker, but fundamentally, the smaller the class size, the more successful children are going to be. As far as is there any research behind school consolidation having positive student outcomes, I would say there's not research in that regard. I would say that most of it has to do with the classroom unit. So I kind of came out of education research, and most of my observation has always been very focused on the education, uh, or the classroom as a, as a unit, a research unit. As far as small communities, obviously when you care about children, you know them by first name. Everybody's a member of a family. Um, there's an incredible advantage to that for districts that can afford it. And um, that's the real issue, is at what point do you try to figure out a basic service level for everybody in a school district, and to what extent can you afford to do, um, can you continue to have small enrollment centers? I work for one district that I've worked for off and on for almost 40 years now, that has two one-room schoolhouses, one with 29 students and one with 35 students. And every year, those schools are up for some kind of reconsideration. And I just think that um, um, it, it's an issue. That district can afford to run those two schools. Um, there are other circumstances that I've been involved in where the district just cut every program under 300. And so I, I think that it all comes back to financial considerations and whether or not a district can afford to run small enrollment centers. Personally, I think smaller is better. I live, I'm moving from one town with 2,700 people to another town with 1,500 people. So um, I'm an advocate for smaller is better, but um, Really, the cost models for public education, given how we're funding it now, are not very friendly to that idea. Uh, Karen Walter, followed by um, Lewis Miller, please. Hi, I'm Karen Walter, a mom of four, three who are currently attending Birchwood. Um, like many have said tonight, this is a special school. Um, I'm a military spouse. And my, my kids have attended four different elementary schools. So I've experienced a lot of schools. This is a special place. And while I hear you saying that you successfully run a school within a school in other places within the district, I have experienced that too. And while the schools coexisted, they did not thrive. And you feel that as a parent as staff and as students. And I don't see how picking this program up and putting it somewhere else is going to have the same results that we have here and now. 
my question is, while you say this program will be moved, will all of the students be provided transportation? I know this year we can't even successfully do that. So are you going to successfully transport or are parents going to be left to take I, care of that? I can quickly answer that question. Everybody over here qualifies, correct? Yes, so I'm getting an affirmative that yes, it would be our intent um, to transport everyone. Okay, even given that this year you can't transport uh, and again, that lightning is striking all over the western <laughs> United States. I work in two other districts that have 40 unfulfilled routes and another that has 20 unfulfilled routes. So this is, it's a national crisis that school districts just can't get drivers right now. Right, and I understand that. So then how can you say, yes, we're going to transport your kids from this community to a school that's further away if you can't provide it now? And that's a fair observation. I'm saying that we're it's our responsibility to transport children. And if we can get a bus and a seat, uh, we will do so. But um, we've had some issues, as have other districts throughout the West. Um, quickly, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask MJ in about 10 minutes how we're doing on time, and I wanna get at least. If there is a time. Find me after, and okay. I'll update you on the whole busing model and okay. the progress there. It's Okay. okay. Um, I have one other question. I was um, listening in on the work session, and in that meeting, it was stated that the majority of the general education students from Birchwood would be moving to Homestead. Why only the majority, and which students aren't going? Um, it's all of them, and there are some students that are outside of the attendance area, but I think it's my understanding that they're in this program. So I would think it would be all of them, and the special education students are the students that we're trying to place, given their IEPs, and where the professionals that would, that would receive their cases are. So when we said that, we were alluding to the special education issue. But it, it was stated as the majority of the general education students. I, I think we would take all of them at Homestead. I think that's our intent to okay, take Okay, that's all not of them. what was stated, so, and that was just two days ago, so that's why I'm questioning. Sure, well, I apologize for that. I, I, I think it's the special education uncertainty that kind of led us down that path of saying it that way, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, Lewis Miller followed by Catherine O'Loughlin. Hi, I'm Lewis Miller. My friends know me as Ray. I'm retired military. I brought my family here, the military brought my family here in 1989 for this school in Chugiak High. That was, we did our research where we wanted to be to, for education was important to us. It's, even though my kids are all gone, I got grandkids maybe that are going to be coming here and I want that for them. You know, I don't want something across town that wasn't this is something special here this is part of the birchwood community and the people that came to this community that are here right here they came here because they chose this place they chose it for this school for that school for the community as a whole and to tell us that we can't budget that, that's baloney. You should have seen a recession coming. The whole world has seen a recession coming. And it's gonna get worse. This budget isn't gonna get any better soon. And the 25 million that you're gonna get from the 5,000 shortfall in students does not make up the 68 million that you claim were short. Okay? What exactly is Eagle Academy? I have no idea. I just got into this about two days ago, so I apologize for being unaware of a whole bunch of things, but I'm catching up quick. You guys said that Eagle Academy is going to come in here when these guys go? What is that? What is uh, Eagle Academy? Uh, yeah, Eric, I can we'll just your question speak right. to that quick, briefly on it. Um, Eagle Academy is a charter school. Um, it is an ABC-based philosophy program, sole, sole program charter school. That's, that's good to know. I think that's really all I got. Great. Thank, Thank you, Ray. You. Thanks for your service. 
Um, let's see, uh, we've got uh, Catherine O'Laughlin followed by Rachel Arveo. Arvello, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi, I'm Catherine O'Laughlin. I'm recently retired from the military, and um, my children have been attending Birchwood ABC since second grade for my 13-year-old, and all the way from kindergarten for my youngest two children who are currently attending. Um, our decision to stay in Anchorage and stay in the Eagle River Chugiak area was based on a Birchwood ABC. We've had multiple opportunities to move, to move out of state, to move to different communities within the Alaska region, and we specifically decided, we've passed in a house, you know, in other areas, because we love and are committed to the Birchwood ABC philosophy and curriculum. Um, it's really disappointing, disheartening, and it kind of makes me wonder about my life decisions, because I love our community. I feel as though Birchwood has given our children the things they need to be prosperous and caring adults in society. Um, if we have to close, because it looks as though the writing is on the wall when it comes to our numbers, and it's very upsetting to know that we don't care about um, our academic achievement, because it doesn't seem to be the priority, because finances are pretty much what's running what's going on here today. We should really be looking at schools that are similar not just an open building that can house more students. From what we have seen, what we all know, because we've all had opportunities to look between Birchwood and Eagle Academy, those are the most similar schools. We practice the same Spalding, um, Spalding and Saxon math, Spalding reading and Saxon math. The kids are kind of being educated in similar fashions. Most of the kids that our kids go to school with have chosen between this school and that, I think it would be the best interest for all if we sincerely consider merging the schools or at least finding a way where they can cohabitate instead of our children who are currently here having to get up and move and go to a school that's further away when they could just automatically be allowed to remain in their building and allowing the children who will have to move to then join in here and we can grow our families of education. I do hope that you sincerely consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for your service as well. Um, uh, Rachel Arbello. Everything I'm going to say has already been said, but I'm asking that you really listen to what I'm saying. Birchwood ABC is not just my home, but is my daughter's home. My family's military, and I've seen three kids go all across the world in many schools. When my daughter started here, she bloomed. I didn't even know her full potential till she moved to the school. Did you hear what I just said? I, her mom, didn't even know her full potential till this school. Birchwood ABC, Mr. Thomas, to our BPO, to our nurse, to our wonderful, wonderful office special, specialists, the teachers, the TAs, the PTA, the cafeteria manager, this school has changed every single student for the better. People buy houses in our school zone just to have their kids here. What is ASD's top goal? Let me tell you really quick from their website. Improving reading proficiency and improving math proficiency. I was signing people up earlier, so I don't know if that was shown, but if it was, I apologize. But I would like to see our stats up here. Get our stats up there. Let's see what our school is doing. Talk to the parents. Talk to the kids who went here to this school. Go to Mirror Lake. Go to Chugiak High School. Talk to those people that actually went here. Talk to the teachers. They'll tell you that they can tell who our students were. Why choose to close our school when our school is your goal? Question. Repurpose. <laughs> On here it says repurpose um, Birchwood ABC for Eagle Academy. I just pulled up their numbers and it says they have 164 students. Our school can handle both of those schools. Mr. Thomas is capable of handling, as you guys have seen, two programs put together. They use Spalding, we use Spalding. They use Saxton, we use Saxton. If you want to see what greatness is, maybe you guys should come to the Red, White, and Blue Assembly tomorrow and see what our school's doing. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Alan McLeod followed by David Clinton, and then at that point we're going to we're going to be at 7:30, and we'll have a little conversation about how we uh, proceed forward with the rest of the evening. Um, is Alan available? Okay. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. Uh, David Clinton made a lot of notes. <laughs> made a lot of 
Uh, are your ears ringing too? I think, I think everybody here knows. It's hard not to be bullish. How we feel about this school? The lottery, I think you've been misinformed. They closed the lottery in May. So there was no lottery. You couldn't have accurate figures if they wouldn't allow us to do the lottery sign up. Oh. Looking ahead, you know, I, I've, I've had a lot of, lots of businesses. I've been with companies that filed bankruptcy. So I gotta ask what your goals are. What's your overall goal? You close these schools, exactly how much is that gonna help that gap? Not that much. But it will create a lot of turmoil. When you look at, uh, when you take one business and you move it into another business, the two businesses don't coexist. One takes over the other. China existed for years because people would come in and take them over but they would be assimilated into the Chinese way. Whereas other countries, they would battle. When Rome was taken and all that, there was still a continuous battle and there was no outcome. When we took in Eagle River Elementary, we didn't come down. We brought them up because it was our environment. <laughs> if you take us and put us in Ah, another environment, the, there's no guarantee, in fact, I can guarantee that, that our students will not be the dominant students, that will go down to a mutual level that they coexist in there. But if you bring that school to a better school, they will elevate to the, what's going on with our community. And it's the community. It's not, you know, the teachers are great, the principal's great, is the overall community and atmosphere that they develop together to make this what it is. This is round one. If, if I was a bankruptcy judge and you brought this to me, I'd laugh at you. And I'd say, this is not a reorganization. And that's really what this is. ASD is a business. It's got to go through a reorganization. But this is not a solid plan to close six schools to start a reorganization. There has to be an over broader, uh, and I realize you're gonna stand up and say, well, we're looking at this piece by piece by piece, but you're looking at, what, 35, 50 days that you're supposed to have a plan in by December for a decision on these schools. If you're gonna make a decision on these schools, that means you gotta have the information on all the other stuff you're gonna have happen. I'm done. Thank you, David. So I've got um, 13 folks more to speak. Uh, MJ, do we have this room for another 30 minutes? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's proceed forward with uh, uh, Jerry Whalen, followed by Kent Marchant, or Marchant. Hi, my name is Jerry Wallen, I am. Um, just as I've been sitting back there and it's been driving me nuts, this is the Glen Highway. Not the Sorry. parks, okay? That's driving me nuts. I just felt I needed to be, that needed to be said. Um, I will tell you, um, my kids and my ex-husband were products of Homestead Elementary. I live in the Homestead Elementary boundary. I have been trying for years to get my kids into an ABC school. When they finally graduated at that point, we got the call and they said, hey, they made it. Okay, no. Now my grandson made it into um, to Birchwood and the difference in him from the year that he went to homestead in kindergarten to the failed Zoom year um, to the blossoming that he's been done. He's now been, he's got an IEP now. He's got so much help here, so much resources that have been available to him and the blossoming that I've seen him, the excitement in him to want to come to school, to want to do good. His teacher is phenomenal. She is a product of Birchwood ABC. She, can't, she loves this system so much that she is here teaching at this school to the benefit of my grandson. The things that he can do now that he couldn't do when he got here, the excitement of, Grandma, I can't wait so I can see Mr. Thomas and do the phonograms. I can't wait to get that check off. 
to a principal that comes in every day to say good morning to these kids in the classes so that they see him as a person that they can turn to, to look to, not as a punishment person. Because I can tell you in the regular school district that my kids went to at Homestead and whatnot, the only time they saw the principal, and the only time I saw the principal is when there was something wrong and somebody was in trouble. So I cannot imagine putting this core group into that at Homestead and seeing that prosper. It will not, it will fail. The school itself is not, um, Homestead is not able, just in the layout, the everything. I, I was at the school, well, the, the, the office admin people are having buckets as the ceiling was, you know, busted and draining and leaking all over the place. It is an old school, yes, they did do some things, but that doesn't make that school better than Homestead. I think that the blending of the Eagle or bringing Homestead here is a more viable option. And trust me, I drive my grandson to school come rain or shine, and I will continue to do that. We need to look at other options than closing the school. Bring Homestead here, bring Eagle Academy here to join in with us, I don't know. But we need to look at that because the man that I want that boy to be, he's going to learn how to do it from here. Thank you very much. Uh, Kent. I'm Kent Marchant, not Marchant. <laughs> um, I have three kids um, attending Birchwood right now. I had my oldest attended here. He started originally at another school. Uh, I'm just going to say it's Alpenglow. And his levels were okay, not great. He came here and excelled. And my three that are here are excelling very well. Um, being a business owner, I don't, when I, if I have, I have multiple offices and I've got one that's doing excellent and you might want to call it a unicorn, that's silly, that should be your shining example. That should not be a unicorn, that's ridiculous to say that. That should be what every other school in this district is based off of and this school district's scores are dismal. And, and you're trying to close down the successful ones. As a business owner, I don't close my successful business and say, well, you know, I'm going to bring the crappy ones over and they'll take over. We'll just set those in there. That's not going to work. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And if you saw a, a funding shortfall in 2017, you knew this was coming. We had schools that got wrecked in the earthquake, and we spent millions of dollars to renovate those when we could have brought kids to successful schools instead of renovating ones that were struggling. That was also ridiculous. You guys are to blame for this. And if you call it a unicorn, why, why should we not be instrumenting all of the, what is taught here, what Mr. Thomas and the rest of these teachers are doing, into all of the other struggling, dismal schools in this district. The curriculum you're giving them is failing. Your math skills are as bad as theirs. You need to fix this. And if that means you all get fired because you're getting paid by my tax dollars and everyone else is in here, and my taxes keep going up, how about yours? Yep. Yeah and we're losing students. So your numbers don't add up. If we're losing students, even with inflation, there's, there's more money per student. That's silly. It's, it's basic business. You, you can't run a business like this. You're like children running a business. You need to fix that. Thank you, Ken. Ken McCarty, followed by Dan Sadler. Hi, I'm Representative Ken McCarty. I used to own a school, special needs school. My heart goes out to you and all that. Also put together a charter school. This is my neighborhood. My grandkids, when they come back, because my daughter's doing work in Cambodia, that they, I expect them to go to this school. My eight-year-old granddaughter, just in May, read the Declaration of Independence to me with no help. So this is the type of quality this school does. Now, 
I have high regards for Jim Anderson, and uh, I still have high regards, you know, because it's a hard issue there. We have a double matrix. We have uh, the, the financial issues that, that keep a business going, school here going. But we also have the matrix of outcome. And this school has the outcome. I, I, over a year ago, I was on a flight with uh, Dave Donnelly and looking at what are schools in the district that have the outcome that the state expects. We just passed the bill saying, you know, read by nine. And this school definitely is doing that. And there's other schools like this that are doing that. Eagle River Academy is such a school like that. So to remove the outcome type thing, I think, is a dismal plan. The financial pieces of I have some solutions here. Instead of diminishing the numbers here, because they already mentioned about the lottery, and you're not dealing with the numbers here. Eagle River Academy has 200 people on the waiting list to go to their school. Their seventh grade program is at 80%. All the other classrooms are completely full. This campus here, we're not allowing, ASD is not allowing them to be at 100% because we're not opening up the lottery. We don't even know, you don't even know what the waiting list is for this school, okay? So don't move the school here. The outcome's doing great. If you're gonna move a campus, if move Eagle River Academy and avail a school, avail Homestead for them. And that'll open up more campus available for that outcome type thing. So we have two schools in our area that are doing ABC programs. And maybe that'll bleed into other schools and we'll have a great outcome for Chugiak Eagle River. The issue of uh, Fire Lake and home, you know, Homestead, you can move kids around there. As I go around to the different areas in the community talking to the families, another big factor is how many kids have moved to uh, home school programs? They have doubled. In my office above Garcia's is Idea and Raven. I've talked to them. And their numbers, numbers have doubled in the past two years. And why aren't they coming back? It's because they want to go to quality schools. And that's, not why they're, that's why they're not releasing the kids. But if we have schools with quality, they will come back. So there you go. Thanks. Thank you, Representative McCarty. Um, Dan Sadler, followed by Justy Warner. Great, thank you. I appreciate uh, very much the chance to be here. I'm Dan Sadler. I'm a 30-year resident, and I was a state representative before Ken. So in that capacity, I've been in many, many of the principal's offices and visited most of the schools in this area. And um, I just want to say that uh, the, the ABC, the Anchorage Basic Curriculum, the Back to Basics Curriculum, really suits and reflects the values of this community. You know, respectful, um, patriotic, um, conservative, and uh, it's a special affront to this community, frankly, that the, the district would look to this community to lose one of their important schools. We've heard the passion that the parents and the staff have for the schools. Um, second, inflation proofing. I've heard the district administrators claim that uh, the lack of inflation proofing is kind of the villain that's caused this uh, shortfall in funds. Uh, it's important for everyone to know that inflation proofing is not allowed. Uh, you cannot have dedicated funds in state government except for the permanent fund because that was a special constitutional amendment. Nothing is inflation proofed except the permanent fund, and that's a special case. It's not revenue, certainly, so it's a matter of doing what we can with the money we have. Um, I'm really concerned that this is not a Washington Monument effort to try to lock in inflation-proofing for education uh, before we get a spending cap. Um, third, I want to say that, excuse me, uh, Senator, but now school board member Dave Donnelly is here, and uh, Mr. Donnelly has advocated strongly for a new revised area cost study which would make more money available for the Anchorage School District without costing the state of Alaska more money. So I certainly hope the administration and the other school board members and the consultant too, if you want to get on board, would support Mr. Donnelly in that effort to uh, help get more money for our district. And respectfully, finally, I want to say what some people might be thinking and might, might want to say, this has all the, all the sniff test of a Washington Monument defense where you have a budget deficit and you propose to cut, to cut something very popular and you force people to back down. They're not, you can't possibly close this and so that you get more money. Um, I certainly hope this is not that and I appreciate you being here and listening to people uh, advocate for solutions and I uh, appreciate that they've got a high powered uh, expert from down south. I hope we can come up with some good solutions that can keep this good program operating here for these good people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Leslie Warner followed by Karen Hawks. Um, real quick on, on uh, Mr. Sadler's last comments, 
If you look at the very last work session, um, I don't know what day of the week, I think it's Thursday. So Tuesday night, the, the very last slide, I spent a great deal of time talking to the school board about three things that are the very last three that the board has to make decisions on before we get to um, really increasing class size across the district. So if you look at $68 million, that's about, if you were to do nothing but, but increase class size, that's a pupil to teacher ratio of 10 at every grade level from K through 12. Naturally, that's not what you wanna do. Um, but there is the district's fund balance, which uh, some of you are aware of, it's our emergency savings. And we talked on Tuesday night about how, to include me, um, you could count this as an emergency. And then the second was the $37 million brought up tonight. We had a discussion um, about do you hold on making any decisions on that until after we are down to PTR? And for those who, who, who don't, I mean, I honestly may feel sorry for all of you if you see every board meeting, but, um, but, they, but, but that particular one, there, there was a very good discussion at the very end about what are the options available because frankly, closing six schools, getting rid of Ignite, getting rid of sixth grade band and orchestra, um, changing immersion program, all of those together don't come anywhere near $68 million. It, it doesn't come anywhere near it. And that's why the discussion started Tuesday night about um, the fund balance and we'll be able to have a projected fund balance by the end of November, um, out through the end of the year that'll be statistically accurate. And, um, and you'll hear discussions about the 37 million. Um, but, but you'll probably hear it every two weeks as the board gets closer and closer. Um, and I know that for the, the folks in the audience that don't listen to all of our meetings, you miss out on a lot when you, when you just see one thing like a school closure or something else. But we, in fact, talk about quite a few other things as well. Trustee Warner. Good evening. First, I understand three minutes is needed to ensure an efficient meeting, um, a public meeting, but I can guarantee you that's not enough, as you've heard tonight. I'm a mom of two kids in this school. Uh, we moved from Anchorage in this area to this area specifically to attend this school. And let me tell you, my kids have a lot of success here. Uh, my first request is who do we send our comments and questions to post this meeting to get all of them answered? Can I just continue, because I have only three minutes, but I hope that you can answer those at the end. Um, my second question is, what are you all here to listen to? What would change your mind? We haven't heard that. In any decision process, there's things that are, make the determination. I feel like I haven't heard that. We can't find $68 million in a few number of months, but I would like to um, commend Mr. Anderson, for your testimony to the legislature over the past five years. Um, I've heard Mr. Bingham say at the beginning that Birchwood has an exemplary program, though it appears that it is not in the criteria for the decision-making of which schools get closed. Further, it was then substantiated by Mr. Vista that the high academic success of Birchwood was one of many unicorns in ASD. I would argue that unicorns are unique. There's, therefore, there can't be many. By definition, that wouldn't be a unicorn. This school ranks in the top for ASD academics and is one of the most diverse. So please, again, what are you looking to hear for us to change your mind tonight? The records speak for themselves, so what are you looking for? I think I speak for many here that we request that you consider the high academic success students in this school achieve in your criteria for closing or potentially closing schools and I also request that you weight this criteria heavily. This may be an easy band-aid to close these six schools for the budget gap, but I challenge you to be look forward-looking, that is on a national and global scale, which would be in the best interest of our students and ASD. Another question, how much funding will ASD allocate over and above for Birchwood than Eagle Academy? Another question, Inlet View, um, Mr. Holland, you spoke about capital and operating funding. Um, there's been a budget gap since 2016, according to the chart. 
Ha have you all considered a statutory change? That is passed in the legislature, but it starts at ASD. So my question is, have you considered that? And finally, I'd like to request a copy of the decision that was made to close these six schools, including all documentation in association with that decision. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know how to process answering all of that. We may have to get back to you on some of that. I think we have learned quite a bit from listening a lot. I know I've learned a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in um, uh, the alternative use of this building, possible combinations, the idea of bringing Homestead here. Um, so I think that those have been central themes. I think we're hearing that a large percentage of you believe that academic performance should be a large part of the criteria associated with school consolidation. So I but but I think I think we are listening. I think we're understanding these these ideas. So I think we're hearing those things. As far as your detailed questions, I don't think in the 20 minutes I've got left to clear the room that we can answer all of those. So we might have to follow up with you on those, but, um, pardon me? Yeah, if you could route those questions through MJ, we can try to uh, respond to you and try to uh, answer those individually. So we'd be glad to do can that. Can I just follow up? Is that decision on ASD's website? Because I can't believe that I'm the only one who would want to read that and see those associated documents. The FAQ page and what's out there on the district website is subpar. It doesn't give us addition, enough information to really come to a meeting like this and provide actual testimony that would be meaningful. That's my point that I'm trying to get across. Okay. Um, so let's take, um, let's see here, uh, Karen Hawks followed by uh, Karin Healy. Karin Hi. Healy. Oh. Trying to get his head start on what I want to say. Um, I'm a mom of six kids in the American uh, ASD school district. And from what I've heard tonight, it sounds like um, it makes most sense to bring Eagle River Academy here. If it comes to closing Birchwood, we cannot lose our curriculum. You said you'd like the focus of um, the level of quality each child gets in 90% of their school day from the classroom to uh, remain the same. And I appreciate that. I would like it in writing that our students will continue to receive the exact same program that they are currently getting here. Um, and you apologetically responded to someone earlier that on that unfortunately will not come down to academics outcome and I wanna know why. I appreciate all the life skills we get from school. I'm the first one to say I don't think school is about test scores, but should not academics be the ultimate goal of a school district? Um, we are a military family, we moved here a year ago and love this school here. I was really pleased to um, come to this school and when I talked to different people while choosing which house to buy, I was warned about Birchwood and their hard academic <laughs> expectations. And I was like, sign me up. And my fifth grader that I was a little worried about because she's not an academic all-star, takes after her mom, I was worried about her making it and she thrived. She had a teacher who just pulled her in and she thrived last year. So love this school. Um, three minutes, three minutes. Okay, I, oh also military, you've heard a lot of military kids go here. And we have to uproot our kids from schools all the time. Every three years, every few years more or less. Let's not make them be uprooted from a curriculum without even moving. Let's let them keep that same curriculum. Um, transportation to a school that will continue the ABC program is a must. This is definitely not a threat. You may not care what I am doing with my six ASD kids, but we will join those ideas, homeschoolers, because I want my kids to have the, the um, curriculum and the education that they're receiving here. And if we can't get it here, then I'll teach it to them. Thank you. I'm sure, go ahead. 
and uh, I just want to say about the curriculum and some of the conversations, I mean, from elementary education, you'd have my dedication to make sure the curriculum and that program piece maintains into Homestead. So I heard that throughout a theme and, and part of the intention with proposing the, the recommendation for uh, Birchwood ABC's program to move to Homestead would to be maintaining the ABC program curriculum and, and, and that sort. Um, I also want to just say with regards to the academic outcomes, they are important though I hear a lot of feedback that the, the decision making would speak to otherwise. Um, my, my concern would be that $68 million um, that we have to come to, that we're, we're gonna touch several things that'll impact our, our academics. And so we're, we need to maintain our academic focus, but my concern to what I expressed was my concern regarding how significant of a budget shortfall we're at. And doesn't mean that your program is different um, or or not important and I, I know I want to make sure I communicate that clearly because I heard that repeatedly so I want to clarify that to everybody here also okay. Thanks, sir. It's better than the rest. so Karen Healy followed by Jess Jones please hi I'm Karen Healy um, we have 12 children um, eight are in ASD um, we've had four that have attended Birchwood ABC, um, one that is currently at Birchwood ABC um, in the special education program. Um, Josiah, I was nervous in coming in this year, um, and here we are sitting, you know, into the second quarter here, and um, I brought him to school yesterday. He saw um, his teacher, and he just went running down the hall. And so I guess my concern as a parent um, would just be, you know, for him and other children in the special education program, just they are known by their name, the general education children here, they um, fist bump him as he goes through, Mr. Thomas knows him, his teachers, um, it's just a very special school. Um, I just would hate to see him get lost in the crowd along with some of the other kids and it's just a very special place, so thank you. Thank you, Karen. Jess Jones, followed by uh, Sandra, Sandra Lambert. Hello, my name is Jessica Jones, um, and I have had, um, I have five kids in um, ASD School District. I have had four of my children come through this um, school, and um, my oldest, I will tell you his story. I was told when he was two and a half years old that he would never speak, that he would never tell us that he loves us, that he would never have any communication with us because he was severely autistic. We found Birchwood ABC, and he, um, not long after being in this ABC program and this curriculum, and having the tight attention that he gets to ha he got to have 15 16 years ago with a different staff than, than is here today so it just speaks to what this school has been over the years and what this curriculum has done today he's 21 he lives on his own he tells me he loves me all the time he is very independent and a very successful young man he has done very well and i a credit this school in this curriculum so much for that. So please remember Tyler Jennings when you're making these decisions and remember Isaac Jennings who went through this curriculum and is now a senior in um, Washington, Western Washington University. His handwriting is atrocious because he didn't start here. Even today, his handwriting, you can't hardly read it and that might not mean much but it means something to, like they said, Mirror Lake and all of these people and the character traits of these young man, men that have today is so incredibly important. And that is things that we can teach them as parents, but when we have a community that comes around and teaches them to be good citizens and to have good character and that they celebrate good character that they don't go to the principal's office because they're in trouble. They get to go and visit when they've done things that, are, that they've done well. My daughter is here now as a second grader, and she is thriving. 
and I am asking you and imploring you, please do not close the school. And my only question is, what's it going to take for you to keep this school open? Because that's not what I'm hearing tonight. What I'm hearing is, the school's closing, deal with it. So please tell me what it's going to take so we can have more success stories, like Tyler and like Isaac. Thank you, Jess. Um, I've got five more, and MJ, I'm just going to try to keep moving, and I'm going to call Sandra Lambert, and Eric, I'm going to ask you to help me with um, What's it going to take? Um, I think we're going to have to consider all of the input. We have six town halls, six virtual town halls, a district-wide survey out on the street, um, options. Um, nothing is decided. Uh, we have a school board that's listening to all of your testimony. You have representatives and senators in this room that are listening to your testimony. I think that this is the way decisions are made in this country. And um, so I think, you know, this is the definition of due process right here. And I think that um, we'll continue to consider the data that we've got and the money that we've got and try to, um, at the end of the day, arrive at a decision. But it's not, it's not our place as administrators, it's up to the board. Jim? So, so first off, I can tell you, the reason board members are here, they are listening. Um, I think I started this with, we have laid out about, I don't know, a dozen plus really crappy options um, to try to catch up for seven years worth of the BSA staying the same. Um, the fact that the, the board um, doesn't make a decision until 20 December, there's, there's several reasons. One of them is, whoever the governor is, their budget will be released on December 15th. We'll be able to get a general feel at that point what direction the state might go. Um, we'll look at a lot of things to include every election, right? I mean, when, when we try to figure out where is Juno headed, um, and, and it really is the governor's proposed budget on December 15th, which never makes it the way it was written, um, but it does give the district and the board um, some idea to project what might happen in the session. And, and that's something I, I have no idea right now what's gonna happen. But I, I can tell you when we came here tonight, we really are here to listen. There are no decisions. There won't be any decisions on school closures until the 20th of December. And, you know, the fact that six schools are on an initial list doesn't mean it's going to stay six. Um, there were a lot of programs that we put on the list that might not be, that, that will change between now and then. This is a very iterative process, and we really needed to get as soon as we had some things identified out to the public so people could provide input while we finished the more detailed analysis and refine the numbers. Um, so it, it, it's complicated, but we could not wait until December and, and throw this on the public and say, okay, you guys got three weeks to give us your input. So, I mean, we are listening and, and, I, and I hope you believe that. Sandra Lambert, followed by Blair Curtis, I think. I'm Sandra Lambert. I'm a first grade teacher here at Birchwood ABC and a community member. I want to thank you all as a community member for being here and listening to us and what we have to say. A lot of the things that I wanted to say have already been said tonight about how great this program is and how special this school is and some other alternatives that we from our biased perspective, think would be better, such as bringing Homestead here or bringing Eagle Academy to share this building with us. Uh, the one thing I would like to reiterate is that we do have a very high academic success. You know, the kids all take these tests and we can put test scores and percentages up on a graph and Birchwood looks good. But part of what makes Birchwood good is not just its academic program, but its culture and its philosophy. And if you put us in with another school that does not share that culture and philosophy with a principal who has so far been running a regular, for lack of a better adjective, I apologize, school, 
I fear that our academic success that can go onto a spreadsheet will not continue because we won't have the school culture that helps create that success. So I strongly encourage you to find a way to keep this school culture open and bring other people to us. We will lift them up. Thank you, Sandra. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with, with um, reading the next name. Blair Curtis. Um, my, my comments already been answered. I don't think I get anything better than Kent Howard said, so I agree with what Kent said. Great, thank you, sir. Um, I've got uh, Rochelle Blake followed by uh, Dina Herning. Deanna Herning. Correct me when you get up. Thank you. I am not Rochelle Blake. <laughs> she signed me up for this. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, there's a discovery that's been done, right? We're having some budget problems. And from my perspective, there's a concern for advocacy. Because you, you can see in this room, a lot of people care about Birchwood ABC. But at the leadership and management level, you guys have to make some tough decisions that's gonna impact everyone down here. But everyone down here seems to be in agreement. But what's not happening is at this level, there's no agreement. That's number one. Number two, you have mentioned that Birchwood ABC was at 51%, but you didn't state what Homestead was at. Um, there's room for Birchwood at Homestead. It's in the high 60s, I think. I could crack a laptop and give you an answer and be delighted to do so after the meeting. So the minority has to adjust to the majority, or is it? Vice versa. There are fewer children here than there are there. So when we put both buildings together, I think we'd have about 450 or 465, which would be about a three section per grade level school. Okay. Um, another thing um, I observed was or discovered is that, uh, you know, typically in these situations, I've been in these before, I'm prior military, um, they've had base closures early in my career, they would do a study before they would actually implement this, the closure. So I think this is a, a lot of fast um, transition to ask the, the parents, the students, the teachers, the staff to make these adjustments in just you know, the short amount of time. And it, it definitely seems like there was something happening in the, you know, prior to this, and then now we all have to make this adjustment. But I do know that if I was to go into the child services office and say, hey, my student or my child is gonna go to another home or something like that, or they wouldn't advocate for that. So keep in mind that you're basically telling my, my son to go to a different home, and this is his home. You know, This is the only home he knows. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. um, is Deanna in the room? I am Deanna, a taxpayer, former parent of a student here, grandparent, and a former BAC president of this school who fought diligently for our numbers and went from a three-classroom kindergarten down, even though we would have attrition. That's how we kept those um, upper-level classes full, but we got shut down. So. Part of it, looking at your numbers here, we can move Eagle Academy with 174 students into here and house it and function. Eagle Academy birthed from Birchwood ABC. Why wouldn't we just inherit that school? That's one question I have. The other thing is we talk about numbers and having to cut. However, when I look at Abbott Loop up there, it says excess to district needs. Why is our district getting bigger but our schools are expected to close. That's what I would like to know. Um, if you'd like. Sure. Abbott Loop would cost more to repair it than it would cost to rebuild it. At this time, because we have excess structure, it 
it didn't make sense to recommend a rebuild. And because of low capacity, it made sense to move them, and that building may get demoed. May. The city okay. will make that decision. Okay, but if we go and we do a remodel on it to move excess district in there. The, the term excess is the term used when you hand it back to the municipality mm -hmm. and not used to define its excess um, the way you're looking at it. It's, it means that the district doesn't need that building. Okay. And then the other thing I have um, a question with as far as money goes and lottery numbers go um, I would be curious to see what are lottery numbers because Birchwood used to have a very high lottery wait list here. Um, and if we deliberately sabotage that, I'm really sad for Birchwood ABC. Um, the other part of it too is we talk about saving money. I'm probably uninformed on this part of it. Do our school board members, are they paid positions? Are they paid with ASD money? If so, maybe those should be volunteer positions because you know what, if we're here for the heart of the kids, it shouldn't be a dollar amount on it because the point of the matter is student success and having a heart to see children learn. The other part is we hire a superintendent who is not qualified for, for a position. Is he getting his full pay? So if we're gonna start talking numbers, we have to look at all of those things. You know, the military, past military myself, fraud, waste, and abuse was a huge thing in the military. Those are things to be looking at. That's all I have left to say. Thank you. So I'd like to take Walter Bryant, followed by uh, Johanna uh, Boscher, uh, last. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. It's getting late. Hi, I'm Walter Bryant. No relation to Dr. Bryant, our okay. superintendent. Um, first of all, I just want to let you all know, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to of what we have to say, I'm sure you all can pick up that Birchwood ABC is a very special school. Um, you know, Mr. Thompson, our principal, he's, he's done a fantastic job with the school. My oldest daughter, she's gone to three different schools throughout elementary. Um, one school in Eagle River, she, I'm hesitant to say this, but it's just a fact. She was told on the playground that she's not cool because she's not gay. And being exposed to something like that in elementary school, it, it shouldn't be something that common. It, it shouldn't be something that, you know, my kid has to come to me and say, hey, this happened today. You know, uh, you, you guys are seeing, you know, well, the kids are gonna go to another school where they're going to experience 90% of the same thing in the classroom. I don't remember learning the excitement of what two times two equals. I remember what happened to me on the playground. I remember what happened to me in the, in the hallways at school. As many other people have said, you're taking one culture and you're bringing it to another culture and expecting everything to mesh perfectly. That sounds great. That sounds wonderful. It's just, nobody can see that actually happening. My youngest daughter goes here right now. She's in Ms. Lambert's first grade class, which by the way, Ms. Lambert, she loves you. Elizabeth loves you. <laughs> so thank you. She, my youngest daughter, she's excited about coming to school. She talks about Miss Lambert often. She is excited. She wakes up loving coming to the school. She, she got an award last year, and the award was character traits, respect, a regard for or appreciation of the worth or value of someone or something. My now first grader, when she was in kindergarten, she showed that character trait. This school praised her for that character trait. She showed appreciation for the worth of someone. I know you guys have hard jobs to do, hard decisions to make. A lot of us don't feel like we, as someone, are being valued. We don't feel like our children are being valued in, in this situation. I understand you guys have hard jobs. I understand you guys have hard decisions to make. But I think a lot of us feel like this deficit that we're facing that could have been avoided years ago is now being held at a higher value or regard than our children. So I just wanna let you know, I'm sure you all hear this, but we've got to reiterate, our kids are our absolute priority 
and keeping this school and this culture intact is extremely important to us all. Thank you. We have one last speaker, Johanna, are you in the room still? Here we go. Hi, I'm Johanna Bashu. Thank you for the opportunity to come up here and have you guys listen to our questions and get feedback and all of that. The question that I had was just off of the slide that was up there about Eagle Academy. I know that they have the same program as um, Birchwood, Birchwood ABC does. I know that they use the Saxon as well as the Spalding. Um, one thing that people have talked about tonight is that culture piece. Um, that culture piece is brought on by some of those admin staff and the office staff and the nurse and the teachers and all of that. So as we go through and look at these school closures and all that, let's not forget that if that's the piece that everybody wants to keep intact, that we also do those things for those principals and for those teachers, that we build that within other schools as well. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the rest of the evening entails. We're going to have okay, fifth. Before we close down, I just wanna say the board's listening to you guys. Member Holloman, member Lessons, and member Jacob, uh, Jacob is here. I know the board also watches. Anybody who's not here is gonna watch this, okay? So we are listening. Member Donnelly, and I'm a former ABC staff. Thank you, Member Donnelly. So what we're going to do is we're going to have 15 minutes of press, and the press folks are going to come to this mic and ask their question, and the panel is going to do their best to answer those questions. So this is for press folks only, these remaining questions. Those of you who want to leave, who have had enough of this, we're gonna give, take about a three minute break here, and if you would like to, to, to head home and on about the rest of your evening, we're going to let fo folks uh, slip out before we do the press portion. Is that what you had in mind, MJ, or did you want just the press in the room? Uh, I think we should just continue to move forward and not take a break. Let's get this. Okay. I, think, I think it's important for the community to hear the questions from the media. Okay, if anyone would like to leave, you're not going to offend us, though. If you, if you would like to take this break and slip out, be careful in the parking lot. Um, if anybody has a problem with a vehicle, there are security people out there that can help us get help for anybody with a problem with the vehicle. So um, with that, we'll move on to the press. Please introduce yourself and I identify your station as you come forward. Um, I'm Katie Anastas, and I'm a reporter with Alaska Public Media. Uh, thinking about the ABC program, I wanted to find out, knowing that Northern Lights also runs an ABC program, is a merger with Northern Lights at all a possibility? Is that a Eric question? Um, that one, that um, Northern Lights ABC is in Anchorage Bowl area with Northern Lights. So um, our intention was to maintain the ABC model out here in the Eagle River area. So that wasn't necessarily something that we were considering of moving it to uh, Northern Lights ABC. You've, you've got three minutes, so um, ask whatever. We're gonna, we, they've got 15 minutes and we're gonna alternate. Oh, okay, I understand, great. Um, hi, I'm Morgan with Anchorage Daily News. Um, you talked a little bit about a transportation analysis that you did and the cost savings that are gonna come from that and the bus routes, and I was wondering if you could go into additional details about what those savings look like and the overall funds that you think each elementary school would save now, if that makes sense, if that three to $4 million number has changed since it was initially announced. Yeah, quickly, Morgan, thank you for the question. So transportation is funded separately, but if transportation is operating upside down, we have to fill in from the general fund. The goal would be to avoid that, of course, so we don't have to use any general fund dollars. So the, the consultant is part of the new software package that we have, have purchased. The first in-person meeting with that team is tomorrow and then we start to go from there. So we're, what we're looking to do is to consolidate routes. And there are many components that we'll be looking at and we'll be recommending to the board for consideration. Uh, one of them is a consolidation based on the software itself and creating efficiencies. Uh, the other one is looking at school start time changes. And the other one is looking at uh, a, po a policy consistent with inclusion with some of the um, IEPs where we have kids or, or even ACT students 
uh, who are on buses with individual pickup that could and very well should be and would welcome opportunity to be, to be included in general education routes, gen ed routes. We think that a combination of all those things has the potential to consolidate up to 50 routes. With that, we can provide a cost parity so we don't ever have to use gen ed funds to supplement the separate transportation funds. But secondly, we could also do, hopefully, someday that efficiency could give us the ability to do some inclusion pieces where we could transport kids to other SWS or even uh, charter programs in the future. Thank you. Um, I had another question about the, talking about the lottery system. Can you explain what happened with the lottery system here and the process of why a school would be on the lottery list before and then get taken off. Thanks. I think for the specifics about the exact lottery piece, the lottery runs um, every year in the, in the late winter and in the summertime with regards to the concerns that was expressed about it not running. Um, I would have to dig into that a little bit further. Um, I don't know if Mr. Thomas, if you have anything to say about that. Just that Birchwood's always been on the lottery. We weren't taken off it. Um, a lot of it is based on student enrollment and how many teachers we have. Just as an example, if I have two first grade classrooms and they're projected to be full, based on PTR, then I can't open up any seats for the lottery. At the same time, I might have two second grade classrooms who are both below, projected to be below the PTR, so I could open up seats in the, for the second grade. So it really is based on the number of teachers you have at the time and the current enrollment, and that's what we, uh, and we use those to project what will be open for the lottery. Shannon, you've talked a little bit about um, birth rate data and, um, you know, housing in throughout Anchorage, housing costs and things like that. But I was wondering if you, have you looked, is there any intent to look at specific birth rates in each neighborhood or if the neighborhoods around certain schools are projected to grow enrollment or, or not? I was wondering if there's any, been any more detailed data analysis at, at that level, if that makes sense. It, it's my understanding that the state of Alaska doesn't collect uh, birth data by elementary school attendance area. Now, I can get census data for, I think, down to the block group level. I can look at that, but it's three years old now. So um, basically, we're mostly looking at our incoming kindergarten volume, and we're looking at the aggregate birth rate for the municipality, which has been a pretty effective indicator of what our incoming Ks are when we disaggregate that to elementary school attendance areas. But um, if we were really looking at a detailed, detailed, detailed analysis, we would probably look at those zero to four-year-olds from the census, but that was collected in April of 1999. So for the most part, those kids are three or four years old, three years old by now. So um, there's just not much out there. And I really don't think the census does a real good job of inventorying kids in the age zero through four. Um, and we're about to move completely beyond that data indicator being useful because of the age of the census. A lot of it's based on estimates too. So. Our, tracking kindergarten year to year is really our best indicator given the data that we've got available. Everybody throughout the country, and I do enrollment projections for about 15 school districts right now, and we're all just seeing every year we're seeing kindergarten go down. It's one of the most dependable things in the school planning business right now is kindergarten going down, unfortunately. Most states are losing one to 3,000 babies born per year just because family sizes are getting smaller. One more question each. Just thinking about next steps, can you talk about 
kind of how set in stone this list of six is? Are, how much time is there with wiggle room in terms of changes to this? Or um, I guess, what are you looking from the board next? So I can give you next steps. We have five more town halls. Um, many of us in, in the senior leadership have, have uh, closed one or two schools in the past. Um, and, and sometimes we have a list that's larger than the, well, always we have had a list that was larger than the number we actually closed. Um, the, what I can tell you is everywhere we go, the, the consensus will be that their school is, is special. Um, we, we all know Birchwood's special. There's none of us we're looking forward to coming tonight other than to be able to talk honestly with you and, and explain um, why we're even in a situation where we would even contemplate closing a school. So um, we will be talking to the board. We have five more town halls to go that are in person. We have six uh, Zoom town halls coming up. Those dates will be put out soon. And uh, normally, um, we, we have been briefing the board every two weeks for uh, the work session on Tuesdays, and we're also gonna have a long work session with the school board on a Saturday coming up because we know that we need many hours to go through everything. So when, when someone asks what is locked in stone, I would tell you that when you lay 25 things out, you, you don't expect 25 things to all get approved. We know that we'll get an idea um, on December 15th, maybe the direction the state might be headed um, during the next legislative session. We also have um, fund balance projections, which we will be able to do by the end of November. We need three pay periods in a school district to be, to be able to make it relatively accurate. And we will have a long discussion on the 37 million for state bond debt reimbursement and whether it's used to buy space and time for the legislature to make decisions during this session. So I, I will tell you, of all the people in the room, uh, when I walked in and when I walk out, I don't, I don't know that I think anything is locked in stone. And, and that's, I mean, that's as sincere as I can say it. We're, we're gonna have a lot of stuff, for, and, and the board will, will pick some of those things. Um, but I don't think even the board could tell you right now which ones they're, they're gonna coalesce on and decide that this is the direction we're going forward. And they know that they gotta figure out what's the level of risk um, on the fund balance and how high can you go and how little can you have left if a roof collapses in the middle of winter and you can't fix it. Um, on the state bond debt reimbursement, a whole different discussion, but it's also money. And um, I, I would just recommend um, paying attention to the, the board meetings. We do media roundtables after every one. Um, the, the news that has been coming out in the press re really has been pretty accurate. Um, that's not always been the case in the past. Uh, but the reporters have really spent a lot of time with us to make sure they understand the difference between what's, what's fact and, and what may be out there in, in the social media world um, where beliefs can become facts. Um, so yeah, I, I, there's no good answer. I, I'm not feeling like anything's locked to include this was gonna end at 7.30. All right, we got one more question and Jim just gave you kudos, so make it a good one. <laughs> Sorry, uh, more of a follow-up, Jim, but can you talk a little bit about, you, I think you mentioned additional analysis that shows how much the district would save by closing each school, like per school. Can you, I just want to get a better sense of the amount that the district is thinking about right now or has projected. Okay, I, I, will, I will try to put something on our website that um, better articulates all of the different factors involved with closing a school. You save more money when you close a school if that school is no longer part of the ASD inventory. Um, Excess is a great word when you're talking to the Muni, but it's, it's a bad word when you're talking to uh, anyone who's not at the Muni. Um, so for Abbott Loop, you would save a lot of money, about 800 plus thousand dollars, um, plus you would save two bus routes because they don't need all four, um, so it would be close to a million dollars. Um, but what we don't know is we started this in July, and we said that we are gonna make sure that we look at student needs 
by IEP, by area, and look at what's at the schools that they're going to, and we're gonna make sure that we try to um, focus on the student. I mean, I know this was about money, that's what kicked everything off. Um, but the next step of this, the execution step of this, is focusing on students and student needs. So some of that million dollars we save from Abbott Loop may very well be put back into some um, specialist positions or something else where when those, those kids do come, because change, change is hard, um, that, that there will be those resources at that school to envelop and, and embrace them and welcome them to their new school. Um, so any number I put out, every time we get more information, and now that we're starting to look at um, the needs of the students at the gaining schools, those, those numbers are changing every time we look at them as we figure out what we have to put. So that's why, um, kind of like the, the 500,000 per school, it, it was a good rough estimate based off like just a little bit of information two and a half months ago. Um, but we keep finding out more, and, and it will be more than 500,000 on average. Um, but I don't want to oversell the amount and then come back and, and not be able to meet student needs. Great, thank you, Shannon. Well, thank you, everybody. This is the uh, conclusion of our evening. We appreciate you uh, coming and being a part of this process. I'd like to thank the media team, the ASL team, um, the uh, uh, security team, and everybody from IT that rigged cameras and microphones and made this a successful meeting. Also, our admin team who were here to answer um, all of the difficult <coughs> questions. And, um, be careful out there on the Glen, and we'll have another meeting tomorrow night at Northwood Elementary. Same time, uh, probably similar duration. Um, and if you feel you would like to have uh, continuing involvement, that meeting is certainly available to you as well. Good night, everyone. <laughs>